Still going bad on you anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, what's happening? It's your boy, Mike Muse. Welcome to another episode of The Mike Muse Show. I am so happy that you decided to join me today. We have a very, very, very special topic. As you know, I love talking about international issues, international relations, love global diplomacy. And as you guys know, what is my favorite go-to tagline? Soft diplomacy. I think soft diplomacy is the key. I prefer soft diplomacy over hard diplomacy for all the obvious reasons that I always talk about. And so what I wanted to do today was, lately we've been talking a lot about what's happening domestically, particularly with like the migrants and the micro caravan was happening from Central America as they approach our borders in Texas. And so I thought that it would be good to switch gears for a second and kind of stick with that theme and really focus on what's happening globally, what's happening in our international waters, what's happening really within Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, the African diaspora, Ethiopia, Eritrea, you name it. I just want to do a deep dive into it just so we can kind of have context of this migrant force that we see in going into Europe and really what's happening right now. We have the Brexit coming up. Uh, we have Angela Merkel right now really in a little bit of a contested position right now because of the refugee crisis that's happening in Europe and it all began to stem from the Syrian crisis. But you know me, this whole intersection of politics and pop culture, I thought what would be a better way to moderate and guide this conversation than film? As you know, it's award season. Uh, we have lots of award shows happening. And most importantly, we have a lot of award shows issuing their nominations. And so thank God for the Mike Muse show. We were able to grab a very, very special guest who just got announced to be uh, the Golden Globes nominee for Best Foreign Feature Film uh, for her work called Capernaum. It's a fantastic movie. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to the Mike Muse show the fantastic, the dynamic filmmaker Nadine Labaki. What's happening, Nadine? Hey. Hey, what's happening that, with you? <laughs> <laughs> Nadine, I am so excited to have uh, to have you, you here, one, I'm uh, excited too. to be in conversation, too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nadine is a Lebanese fi uh, filmmaker. Yeah. And if I got the stats right, Nadine, you are the first Lebanese filmmaker to receive a Golden Globes. Is this true? Yes. I mean, that's, that's history. That's completely history. And like, it's like a national thing now. It's like the whole country is nominated. I mean, it, it <laughs> is. I mean, because yeah. you really bring the pride yeah, of your country absolutely. to yeah. the award shows, mm -hmm. which is the point of like these things that highlight diversity, highlight fascinating stories and narratives that we never would have been much familiar with. And I think now as, as a result of your award, uh, your nomination, I should say, we're going to be able to learn so much more about Lebanon, right? Exactly. And so you'll be able yeah. to go on more shores like this in America to really understand one, who you are, right? Mm -hmm. Then your decision points, but also to the characters of this film, but then the country as a whole, right? And the role that Lebanon plays within the Middle East. Exactly. So cheers to you for standing up for Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. How does it feel to be a Golden Globe nominee fresh off like two I mean, days? It's, uh, it feels like a victory, really. It's mm. a victory not only, you know, for us as the, uh, crew, filmmakers, scriptwriters, um, producers, because we've put so much... Uh, work and heart into this film was like almost a homemade film. This is a yeah. film that we made on our own. It took like six months of shooting. We have like over 500 hours of, of rushes. We two years of editing, three years uh, ahead of research. So it mm -hmm. took a very, very long time. So to be rewarded in that way, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a huge victory. And yeah. it's all, also an amazing victory for all the actors who are in the film who... Um, you know, are almost invisible. Uh, mm -hmm. Up to that point, uh, uh, almost all of them are, no, all, all of them are non-professional actors, mm -hmm. but almost all of them have you no know, papers, have been living in very difficult condi the condition, uh, conditions in Lebanon. So to be able to resonate, for their voices to be able to resonate this high and and to have this kind of exposure i think it's putting the problem and it's shedding a much bigger light on what we're trying to say in the film mm. and the message that we're trying to convey and their message the way they you know talking about their problems their struggle it's it's making the it's making it um even bigger mm. and and this is very important and it's and it's i think it's I truly believe in the power of cinema and I truly believe in the mission that cinema can have, mm -hmm. not only as, you know, in entertainment, but also, you know, shedding the light on important issues in this world. 
Now, Nadine, you and I are, you're, we're beginning to pull out some of the social constructs of the film. Um, but for our audience who has yes. yet to see it yet, mm. from a 30,000 foot perspective, give us a bit of the synopsis of what the film is. So this is the story of a child who's 12 years old who is suing his parents for giving him life. But he's actually suing the whole world uh, for not giving him, you know, his most basic fundamental rights or giving him the tools to to make it in this world. Mm -hmm. So and in the film, we start understanding why, what what got him to this point, to the point where he stands in front of, of a judge. And this is how the film starts. It starts with this scene where he's standing in front of a judge and saying, I want to sue my parents for giving me life. Mm -hmm. And he's actually not only suing his parents, because obviously in the film you understand that his parents are as much victims uh, of, you know, a system that is not even allowing them to breathe. Um, and so that's, I'm not going to say too much yeah. about it, yeah. but you start understanding the, 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 the you know, the context. Yeah. And it's really inspired by the sight of, of, of those children that is becoming more and more, um, you know, almost part of our daily lives, living in Lebanon uh, with the Syrian refugee crisis. You know, Lebanon has hosted over a million and a half refugees right now. And mm -hmm. Lebanon is a very, very small country. Mm -hmm. It's almost, you know, a dot on the map. Mm -hmm. and when we were kids, the teacher used to tell us, you see this invisible map, uh, yeah. dot on the map, this is Lebanon. So can you, you can imagine the, 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 the hugeness of the problem. So mm -hmm. you, you see lots of children on the streets lately mm -hmm. and children working, children deprived from their most basic rights, children begging, selling gum, ha l you know, carrying heavy loads. And also the, f the you know, the side of ch those children that you see, you know, over the internet on social media. And I remember very well, you know, the, the sight of this child. I don't know if you remember him a few years ago. His name was Alan Kurdi. He's a, he's a Syrian refugee yep. and he was found dead on the shores of Turkey. Yep. And I remember very well that moment when I saw this image. I thought, you know, if this child could talk, what would he say? Mm. What would he tell the world? Um, mm. What? How would he express himself? How How does he see the world that you know put him in, in in this situation? What did he think when he was struggling, you know, in the water against the waves? What did he think when he took that you know rubber inflatable uh, boat? Where Where did he think he was yeah. going? So it was all in wanting to understand or being the voice of those kids because. They are paying the highest price for our faults, for our wars, for our conflicts, for our stupid decisions and our stupid governments and our failing systems. They are paying the highest price and didn't, they didn't, didn't ask to be here. Mm -hmm. What I think is so interesting about this whole narrative is that we see so much on the news and on television about the Syrian conflict. Yes. Uh, and we see so much in terms of how governments are interacting with each, with each other, how the United States are responding to Turkey, how we're responding to Syria, and then how in general the Middle East is kind of going through a, a, re, a revision of itself, if you will. We see new players are now coming exactly. into play and, mm -hmm. and coming into position. And we always talk about like this migrant, uh, this migrant Crisis. force and system that is happening. We also talk about these refugees, mm -hmm. but we never actually begin to see the human characteristic of any of it, right? It's always Absolutely. like this grouping of individuals. Mm -hmm. But I feel what's so powerful about this is that the boy that you use, who goes by the name of Zane in the film, you really begin to see the pain of what this conflict really represents and really what it resonates. And uh, although I'm not, fr I've never been to Lebanon, I've never been to Syria, I've never been to Turkey, I've never been to, you know, to those parts of the world, I could relate. Um, because what I saw on his face and what came out was hopelessness, right, and poverty. And then there's an anger against the world, right? And the anger against the world is, how exactly. can I exist? How world can you even allow no. me to exist to something that's not even my own? And so you look at this kid who is in this really perplexing adult situations, but he still has to be a kid, but still has to act like an adult for survival. It's stuck in the system while adults 
and politicals and other operatives are really sealing his fate and he has nothing to do to with do it. it, which is to me represents the lawsuit. It not only goes against his parents, but it's really society as a whole so frustrating. I can only imagine that's really what it must feel like for the over one million Syrian refugees that has fled into Lebanon. And What's really more striking for me, Nadine, is when I began to do my research, what was happening over there, the fact that 87% of registered Syrian refugees and 67% of the poorest part of Lebanese over in Lebanon all coexist within the same space, right? Exactly. Which then begins to create this conflict of Lebanese nationalists, right, with Syrian nationalists. But that's no different than what we're seeing play out across all of our borders throughout the globe, over in Germany, over in the UK, exactly. over in France. And I hate to say it, but even here in the United States of America, we're seeing this us versus them and what happens in that moment. And so for you to use the children from that lens was just a spectacular exactly. moment. And the, my audience knows I love talking with directors more than anybody because you guys control the narrative of the film. You guys have the decision points. So what was it about you that decided to tell this Sorry. global crisis through the lens of a child? Because for me, exactly like you're saying, a child is a child, whether he's Syrian, whether he's Mexican on the Mexican border here, whether it's being separated from his family, whether he's Indian working to feed his family, whether he's Lebanese or Palestinian, a child is a child. And, and this child is really paying the highest price for our intolerance and our conflicts. So for me, that was the igniting point for me that I wanted to tell the story through a child. And exactly like you're saying, it's 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 a different thing than hearing about the problem in the news, you know, through figures and statistics and number. Through cinema, you can actually humanize the problem. You can actually put a face on the problem. And this time it's the face of a child who's struggling because no no one makes sense more than a child mm. more than the purity of a child's soul who's not uh, at this point yet um uh, changed by society's code or, or or changed by politics or informed by mm -hmm. by hypocrisy a child is a child and a child makes sense so for me f in order to be able for me He's the one that makes more sense. Yeah. So when he's standing in front of a judge and he's actually standing in front of a whole, our society of the whole world and saying enough, you can do, you can't do this anymore. I think it's the only way for me. Mm -hmm. This, this makes the most sense mm -hmm. because it's coming from the, 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 the mouth of, of a child with his pureness, with his clean a heart with his clean mind and he, he makes sense i think he makes more sense than any politician or any anyone yeah. really i love how you said a child is yet not formed by politics yes. is not formed by biases right and the child in his purest sense doesn't understand racism it doesn't understand xenophobia exactly. transphobia homophobia it doesn't understand those that's really put into the child as a child grows up by society and by the parents and so for you using that was just brilliance that really showed the, 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 the innocence of it another brilliant decision that I think that makes you such an exceptional filmmaker <laughs> is how you chose to shoot this film um, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try my best to describe it so I can tee it up so that Nadine can correct me 1000% on everything uh. with that. But what she did, folks, was she took uh, this really adaptive, flexible screenplay, if you will, and allowed her actors who were non-trained, uh, not professionals, to really begin to play out these narratives as, ex as if it was really happening to them. Um, and so for our perspective, the best example I can give, and they Dean, please excuse me for using this example, but this is just to try and emphasize a point. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, like the real world meets like one of the other reality shows, but yet told through like a script that has a constructed narrative uh, that is using real human beings that are actually going through that crisis. Same thing. Yeah. Did I get it right, Nadine? Exactly. It's very right. <laughs> and I think that's what makes this film so insane where yeah, you really, as insane. I was watching it, I couldn't separate fact from fiction, yeah. reality from not. And then to really learn that the main character, Zane, actually is a refugee. And then to, I don't want to give too much away, but then there, there's a baby in the film. But then to understand that this baby is being raised by this boy because his mother left him, which you will see in the movie. 
But then to know the real baby in real lives, parents were actually deported while you were making the film. Yeah, we were imprisoned like, while we make the film. Yeah, yeah. How insane. It was insane. It was insane. I mean, I, I mean, it literally goes to that conversation, ladies and gentlemen, like when life imitates art, art imitates yes. lights. And yes, I'm putting my head on my hand. <laughs> I, just, I just couldn't believe how you did that. And the, yeah. the timing and the narrative of it was just so wild. Talk to us about that because that's just such unusual, yeah. like, uh, method of filmmaking. I think it was very unusual and I knew from the start that this is what we needed. We needed, we need to just, we needed to be very open because I knew that life was going to give us so much because when we were, we decided to shoot obviously with people who are in that same situation, who live in those slums where we shot the film. Uh, Zayn uh, is a Syrian refugee. He's been living in Lebanon for the past eight years in very difficult conditions. He grew up on the streets. He knows the streets. He knows deprivation. He knows abuse. He knows m mistreatment. It's a child who, who's been in that situation. So for me, I've never asked them to act. I just ask them to be, to be who they are in a certain situation that we have created as filmmakers. Mm -hmm. So this is how you see, you, we're, we keep, you know, going back and forth between fact and fiction, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. And this was exactly the aim to make you completely confused be, be, between, is this real or is this fiction? How can this reality be in such a fiction? So we knew from the start there was a very, very solid script because you can't really improvise mm -hmm. if you don't know your material really well. So we had a very solid script that was very much inspired and based on real things that we saw during our research because we spent three years doing research. Mm -hmm. So we wished to go on, a re on the research and then go back and write everything we saw. And we weaved together all the scenes that we saw in real life. So the, the film was really based on things that would really happen. It's not fantasized. It's not something that, you know, we imagine every single detail of the film. Then we go, we start shooting in real location with real people, with people who've never acted in their life and who are almost living the same situation in the film. So also in the way we shoot, you're actually capturing their reality wow. and navigating navigating it towards the fiction that was written, always navigating, always guiding them through it in their own personalities, being also the vehicle for them to express themselves. So you have to be very invisible also in the way you shoot. You have to create the space for them to be able to be free, to be able to be themselves. You cannot really block them or par paralyze them in very complicated camera movements or in very uh, complicated mise en scène. It has to be very organic. So we shot everything we shot on handheld, you know, cameras were always moving. If you see the making of, it's like they're dancing to mm -hmm. uh, around the actors all the time. So. And then, yes, when you when you're ready to capture also whatever life is going to give you things like crazy, insane stuff would happen. Exactly like what you said. Rahil in the film, the Ethiopian woman gets arrested. We're not going to say too yeah, much, yeah, but yeah, she yeah. gets arrested in the film. Two days after we shoot that scene where she gets arrested, she gets arrested in real life oh. because she was exactly in the same situation, illegal, invisible, no papers. So she gets arrested. Not only that, the mother and father of that a little child, Jonas, who's actually a girl in real life, her name is Treasure, they get arrested with her at the same time. So we, when we are actually shooting those scenes when this girl is alone without her mother, she was actually alone in real life without her mother. So this is where, as filmmaker, as a filmmaker too, I was the whole time conf confused. What is this we are doing? Are we capturing real life or are we doing a fiction? And it it really made us as you know crew and and people who are working on the film like it 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 made us have you know this awareness that this is bigger than us. We're part of a bigger mission in a way. We have. We have this uh, this uh, responsibility to say things the way they are, and that's what we did. That's why we t we try to intervene the least possible. We try to make mm. to make it the least possible manipulative. Just you know, just trying to just capture that moment and navigate it 
towards the fiction that we had written. So it was a very interesting process the whole time. And I think I'm interested in doing it. It's a challenge for me as a filmmaker. I'm, I'm, I'm more challenged to do that than to be able to just, you know, have a very solid or, or structured script and follow every single thing in it. It's wow. a completely different way of working. That's why we shot six months. I'm completely moved by that. <laughs> I mean, to the point I don't even know how to respond to that. Just knowing as you're filming this, you're seeing real life play out and to yeah. have the wherewithal of wanting to document it and capture it and then not intervening and have that your human instinct kind of kick exactly. in. Exactly. Uh, which is now I'm just going to just throw it to my next guest. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to bring you in hot um, <laughs> just because this is where we are in the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, joining the Mike Muse show uh, is a very fantastic guest. She goes by the name of Samhar Araya, uh, who is fantastic fantastic and dope and insanely gifted and smart and she's someone who I've always wanted to have on the Mike Muse show. Uh, she is UNICEF's USA's uh, Managing Director of Diaspora and Multicultural Partnerships. Somehow in just 30 seconds tell us what UNICEF is and then can you bear witness to what Nadine is talking about with the work of your organization of, yeah. see, of hearing these difficult stories. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I'm with UNICEF USA. It's the United Nations Children's Fund. Um, we're in 190 countries working to help the world's most vulnerable children. And UNICEF USA, we work with the American public to raise awareness, to build partnerships, to fundraise, to educate, to advocate. So we really rely on the generosity and partnership of Americans. And I think what Nadine's shared and the, the beautiful work that she's created is so thoughtful and really captures the spirit of what I think children in the most devastating situations situations are going through. And really what we try to do is highlight the needs, highlight the, the disparities, highlight the suffering, but also offer solutions and show what impact could look like for a child. And so we're in Lebanon. We're also in Syria. We work throughout the Middle East and around the world. And really it takes courageous voices, partners, organizations, people who are willing to bring their voice to the front line to speak about the, the desperate situations, the, uh, the gross uh, human rights violations, the suffering and needs of children. But it also takes brave voices like yours to also think about what do we do about it? And so that, that's what we do. Um, and what, what Nadine has captured with Lebanon is quite stark. Uh, Lebanon, you know, it's a small country, six million people, but also in terms of size, Lebanon is actually absorbing the highest level of Syrian refugees around the world um, in proportion to its size and population. So while there are larger numbers of Syrian refugees in other countries, Lebanon has had the highest absorption and it's had serious impact on its economy, on its um, on its day to day life and also just decades of systemic conflict or insecurity in the Middle East means okay. that other migrant groups, other refugees have arrived. Mm -hmm. um, so Lebanon is in a situation where not only has it had to absorb the plight of Syrian refugees, it's also absorbed absorbed Palestinian refugees, it's absorbed North African refugees, Sub-Saharan African refugees. It really is one of the most um, challenging spaces for not just the arrival and absorption of refugees, but also for Lebanese communities who have needs, who are also in poverty, children who also have um, vulnerabilities and emergencies. And so we work with Lebanon in such a way that we're really thinking about how do we provide services to those most in need, those children who are Lebanese, who are Syrian, who are Palestinian, who are from wherever. Because as you say, a child, a child is, a is a child. child. And also, as we say at UNICEF, I'm sort of sitting back stunned because you have really <laughs> captured the heart and spirit of what we do, um, reminding the world that children should not be forced to pay the price for the adults, for the mistakes of adults, um, for the actions of adults. Um, and children, through no fault of their own, are finding themselves in situations that they don't have the ability and agency um, to to stand up for themselves. And we, we, we try to create that space through our programming, through our partnerships, to allow children to speak for themselves, um, to, to tell us what not just their needs are, but how they're feeling, how they're doing. Our work includes, I mean, there's trauma, you know, there's psychosocial support. And most importantly, we need to focus on letting a child be a child. Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, that means help them go to school, help them remember to play, you know, not turn into adults mm -hmm. too soon because of the tragedies that they've witnessed and, and had to endure. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it was so important for me to have both of my guests in conversation with me today, in particular from the UNICEF lens, just because that's what their focus is, is children. Um, and I'm sitting here stunned, and I talk about this work on an everyday basis, and I have never, 
I thought watching the film, I was able to put a human characteristic, a human narrative to the policies I always discuss. But uh, even this conversation, just listening to you, Nadine, I'm even taken back even more. And so let's take a little break right now just to reset the room um, and to really just come back. And so I'm just going to just ask you on when we come back on the other side of the break is just like from a personal perspective, how do you separate you know, work, like how do you leave it at your doorstep when you walk into your apartment? Because like I'm struggling and it's only been 25 minutes. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, listen to the Mike Me Show here on Sirius XM. Uh, feel free to make this a two-way dialogue, a two-way discourse. Uh, you can always tweet me at I am Mike Muse, M-U-S-S-M-E on Twitter. Also to here at Sirius XM at S-X-M Insight. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Mike Muse Show. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation that we're having right now. Uh, somehow I threw it to you and so I wanted to hear your perspective on the other than the break. Uh, but I actually think I want to have director's prerogative. <laughs> and I want to deep walk uh, to our filmmaker uh, who is still with us, who is absolutely fantastic and amazing. Uh, Nadine, uh, just one question I have for you as I'm thinking about this conversation. It was like, how hard was it for you not to intervene? It was, um, it was you know, it's like a dosage that you you feel instinctively it, it's it wasn't that hard actually not to intervene because sometimes you know when to do it sometimes and and you know when not to do it it's something very instinctive and it's really what the scene needs and it's really what also your own values uh tell you to do it's it was not that hard not to intervene actually i was i was more amazed to see how and to observe more than intervene sometimes we were so invisible that people i didn't i never had to tell somebody not to look in the camera uh, because we were we, we in a way we we blended in so organically mm -hmm. and the fact that also we spent so much time six months of shooting was that we we became part of the setup in a way and 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 so that that was like a dosage like instinctive that yeah. you 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 that you find along the way nadine i know i had a sneak peek of it but when can our audience view this fantastic film the film is going to be released here on the 14th of December, mm -hmm. so they can start watching it. That's amazing. And how can people reach you? Because I'm going to let you go, because now I'm going to get more of into a deep dive on like policy and all that kind of good stuff. And of so course. I want to shield you from that. <laughs> so uh, how can people reach you if they have more questions about the fantastic work that you're doing? Uh, yeah. reach a Twitter? Me. Or? A Twitter, of course. Yeah, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. I have. What's your Twitter handle? Sorry? What is your Twitter handle? What do you mean Twitter handle? Uh, how can people find you? Is it Nadine? Nadine Labaki. Yeah. Okay, Simple. just Nadine one Labaki. Uh, yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Nadine, congratulations on your Golden Globe nomination. You are absolutely fantastic. Uh, and you are you so a much. gift to you our society. Oh, uh, thank you so Best much. Best of luck. So Samar, we just heard uh, Nadine and we heard her talk about how she was or was not able to suppress the human instincts to help. Uh, the question I had for you is, is exactly the same. I'm just curious to know, I mean, what we see on film, I watch for two hours and then I go on about my life. Um, and I don't think about it until I have to, per se. Uh, Nadine, uh, that's gonna sit with her for a while, obviously. Uh, with you, this is technically your nine to five. Uh, this is the work that you do, but you're human. So how are you able to separate when you're at your nine to five and you are hearing these really difficult stories of children um, and then you are working and advocating tirelessly with your team and your colleagues to make the change, right? How do you go home, right? And then how do you separate that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, these kinds of stories are really hard to uh, to take in. Um, and there's a serious uh, need to just focus on self-care, focus on your own role, where you stand in this world. And, you know, even though it is a nine to five, it's also really my, my life's work. It's my mission work. And I think when you do mission work, you think a lot about how you can sustain yourself for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's about knowing that there are so many others in need and that Really, I'm in a place of privilege by virtue of um, being the daughter of Eritrean immigrants, born in the States, having a chance to go to school, all these things that brought me to a place where I'm really thinking about service. And with that mindset, it's about service and gratitude. I mean, because if you don't have your anchor and if you don't locate yourself early on in this kind of work, mm -hmm. you can lose yourself really easily. Right. And, you know, the hard part is we have so much going on in life that 
These are the stories that people don't hear. They don't want to hear. It's too difficult. And, you know, we really have to be careful about uh, not not constantly delivering it in such a negative way, but helping people see the opportunities. And I think that's also an angle that helps sustain, uh, sustain myself and sustain others. Um, when you're in the business of service, you also know that there's going to be goodness on the other side. Mm-hmm. And that that keeps you going. I like that. So it's almost uh, the glass is half full perspective. I feel like lately that's been my mantra is the glass is always half full Yeah. because we always have to try and be solutions because we can sit with the problems and the challenges for oh so long and to the point that we have to actually do something about it. And one stat in my audience, you guys know I love stats and data. Uh, so this doesn't, it's just a feeling that I have. Um, but to really give some weight uh, to this conversation, I want to get your response uh, mm-hmm. to this. Um, in Lebanon, 80 point Nine percent of registered Syrian refugees are women and children, uh, compounded with poverty. Women and children are particularly exposed to many forms of physical, sexual, and mental abuse throughout their attempt to survive. As such, ensuring protection from sexual and gender-based violence is one of the key priorities of the humanitarian community. Yeah. What do you say to that when you hear that type of stat? What do you say to that when you hear that type of data? And then what do you say to... You know, Americans uh, who we exist through this politicized, polarizing lens um, where we may not understand how we all are one world, if you will. Like, how do you respond to that type of data and stat? I mean, it's it's the saddest uh, fact. I mean, that women face uh, higher levels of violence en route um, and that they're disproportionately affected um, under gender based violence. Um, but, you know, a mother will always do what she needs to do for her child. And oftentimes it not only means risking her life, it means um, harming her body, you know, mm-hmm. to, to protect the child. And that's one of the saddest things we see are the levels of trauma that mothers in particular and young girls face on that journey, mm-hmm. on that route. You know, whether it's Syria, it's Boko Haram, it's um, in, in Yemen, it's in Mexico. Every region has had the saddest cases of women enduring forms of sexual violence mm-hmm. and attack. And that really, at the end of the day, harms and hurts the entire family, right? Because the mother has to continue protecting the child and helping the child, but she herself has so much pain. Yeah. And so we, we work a lot around um, family, one, family reunification, because mm-hmm. there's also separation at hand, but also psychosocial support and helping parents who have gone through a disaster Um, You know, we call this a disaster, but not the kind of disaster you think of. There's natural disasters, weather, climate change, issues affecting um, um, unpredictable disasters. And then there's man-made disasters. And really, we have to realize that these wars, these conflicts, um, this instability is man-made. But it is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And in that, you know, people have to carry such burdens and go through so many harrowing um, journeys. And women are are facing it the most. Um, Silently, they... They carry on for the sake of the children, mm-hmm. for the sake of the family, and for the sake and the hope of a better life. I love that you're actually even, for me, listening to you, and I'm very familiar with UNICEF. Uh, I'm very familiar with a lot of humanitarian organizations that are out there that are doing this type of work. Um, but I've never actually, I guess, had to sit with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in particular, sit with it after seeing a film where the visualization of it is mm-hmm. really just so real. So somehow, how do you guys manage that migrant? caravan, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, that refugee uh, caravan throughout so many different countries, right? As they flee Syria, do you guys in in, in essence follow that track? Do you you follow that journey? And then how far do you guys go within Europe, within the Middle East, within diaspora as a whole? Yeah, I mean, we focus on the wholeness of the child, so zero to 18, making sure that a baby can live into their adulthood and have a prosperous life that's safe and healthy. We're really looking at it in a holistic way. It isn't just a a siloed sort of response. Um, But even with that, migration, you know, migration is not new. And it isn't a bad thing. It's a very, very human journey. Um, You know, you migrated from the city you were born in to go to college, from college to work. But we sort of lose sight of the normalcy of migration when it's over there and when Mm -hmm. it's at the hands of a man-made disaster at a country that we've never seen. We start to distance ourselves from the very, very real um, truths that we all have, which is we migrate. It's a universal human experience. Um, The problem is that we are having migration levels at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. There are 258 million migrants around the world, um, but 50 million of them are children who have been uprooted. So what is 
the the root cause of that, yeah. right? I, I think it's too easy to say that it's just man-made. Yeah. I think it's just too easy that it's two governments at conflict with each other. So then as a result, the children and their communities and their citizens suffer. And and this may be a question, you know, you can't answer. And, and I'm fine with that too as well. But I'm just always trying to figure out what the root of it is. Like, for example, if you look at... Uh, and, and the reason I'm asking this question is because the Middle East is a very complicated place um, in, in its relationship to Europe and also to its relationship to the continent of Africa, um, where for so much domestically, even on the Mike Muse show, we've been talking about it from the lens of the migrant caravan from Central America. And listeners, you know that I was talking to you about the root cause of that migrant caravan, how they move north from Central America, um, from Honduras, from Guatemala, is because it's due to the gang culture, um, the threat of everyday violence that these families have to endure, uh, the, the, the lack of education. Um, so if there's a lack of education to really there is no education, then you really take away somebody's ability to think about their future um, and to think about what could be next for them. So there is no education. Uh, they live in violence and fear of violence from gangs every day. Then there is no job prospects, right? And so then they have no choice really but to flee. But a solution for that could be soft diplomacy when it comes to not just the U.S., but could other governments come to play to help assist with that soft diplomacy, assist with the stabilization of the violence, to assist with education and to assist with economic development for jobs. Over there, right, in, in the Middle East, in, in Syria, like, what could be some of the, the solutions? Is it soft diplomacy? Is it education? Is it jobs? I, is it the way the governments are set up? Is it just too complicated to even come in from that top line uh, kind of perspective? Just curious. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the critical component for a solution is the communities are in charge of their fate mm -hmm. and organizations, local local entities, that they can decide for themselves what they need. And it is a combination of all the things you've listed, lack of access to education, um, job uh, underemployment or unemployment, poverty. Um, but again, like the solution is people, no one wants to leave their home. No one wants to ever leave their home. Such a good point. But you leave because you're either you either have an opportunity, mm -hmm. right? You have an opportunity to education or a job, or you need to find a better opportunity for your livelihood or for your life. So these people fleeing are at at their at the end of the rope. You know, they, no one wants to leave, and everyone dreams of being back home or staying home. And even if you go for a positive reason, you think about the day that you can move back. Mm -hmm. And so. What we're seeing are millions and millions of people, families, children who are fleeing because they have no other choice. Mm -hmm. And that solution starts with, you know, um, first of all, security, making sure that they're not caught in violence, that they're not mm -hmm. caught in war. Right. Uh, ending wars, calling for peace, but also beginning to have an economy that can serve all. And whether it's an income disparity, whether it's rising levels of poverty, whether it's marginalized communities not having access, you know, they have to take matters into their own hands. And that's where we're at with so many parts of the world. Um, and it's devastating to see. Uh, but you know, the, the good news is that, I mean, the United Nations just, we uh, signed a global compact for migration. Uh, governments have committed to make deeper investments to help all migrants. But in particular, when you think of all of these people moving around the world, it's the ones that are fleeing from persecution, who fear for their lives, who are seeking asylum, who are seeking refugee protection, um, that have suffered in levels that we just simply cannot imagine, we can't even relate to. You brought me to two different places I want to go. Um, my listeners know I never have any pre-planned questions. I never know where a conversation is going to land. But you mentioned two things. One, uh, community, community building, community responsibility. Uh, then you also, too, mentioned the essence of no one wants to leave home. And I think that is something we miss in the national discourse, is that we think that it's people's first choice to leave home, to go to another country. Yeah. I think it's people's first choice to come to America or to come to Europe or to come to somewhere else. But reality is not. Right? right. People want to be by their families. Right. And they've it's, already endured endured so much that they finally have no other option but yeah. to leave. They've they've applied to every job possible. They've moved how many times throughout the city or country. They've asked their friends for support. They've tried starting their own business. They've negotiated with the bad guys. They've asked for mercy. They've done everything imaginable. You know, at all the options were on the table. Yeah. And the last one, the one that they don't want to do is we have to leave. Because even listeners, think about this for your own selves right now about that comment right there. Like 
I have so many friends. I was just talking with a friend of mine yesterday, actually. Uh, he currently lives in Texas. Um, that's where his family is from. Uh, I met him while he was living in New York for, for some time. He moved back to Texas for jobs and for economics. And we were talking on the phone yesterday. And I asked, I said, do you want to come back to New York City? And he said, absolutely, in a heartbeat, if I can just find the right job. And I said, well, could your job transfer you? And he said, it, it could if I wanted to. So I said, well, what's keeping you in Texas? And the first thing he said was family, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's a narrative you hear play out so many times from our friends, right? When they are, because let's keep it real. New York, a lot of us moved to New York. I moved to New York from Michigan. A lot of my friends that I have are transplants from a different city. And every time we get together, there's always this notion of, do I want to go back home? Um, right. I miss my mom and dad. I miss my family. I miss being around my my nieces, my nephews, right? right? I, I miss that, right? And so even for us yeah. who are privileged, right? Who have it good here mm -hmm. in America, we still want to go back home. That's what I'm saying. And we still want to be close to home. So imagine these families that are leaving their countries. They, they're just like us. They want to be near their family. Family is that one connection that we all have as humans, uh, as even in the animal kingdom, right? How they travel in tribes and packs, right? There's this familiarity, this family yeah. life that, that they have. Yeah. And so that was something I never really thought about. Somehow, I, I want to pivot just for a second um, because something that struck me um, in the film was seeing... Uh, there's a there's a character who is Ethiopian, and there was this narrative of Ethiopian migrant workers who are working in Lebanon and in that in that space. Uh, you mentioned that you are Eritrean. Uh, I'm just curious. That was something I didn't think about. Right. Uh, I never thought about Ethiopian migrant workers um, being invisible and being paperless in Lebanon. That was just something that didn't even cross my mind. Is there a migrant pattern coming from the continent of Africa and the diaspora into uh, the Middle East? Can you just talk to us a little bit about that and just maybe give our listeners just some context about that? Because I know I was completely ignorant to that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the continent, it's 1.3 billion people. It's about to double by 2040. People are looking for jobs. Um, young people are looking for opportunities. And then there's it's compounded by the desire for a better life is compounded by climate change. And so parts of the continent are also enduring um, severe desertification. You know, the, the grass is turning dry. Farmers can't grow their crops. People with livestock can't feed their animals. So what's happening is there's all of these reasons people are moving around within the continent, right? But then, you know, out of the out of the, the complete migration um, in Africa, I would say 83% of migration in Africa is internal. Mm -hmm. It's a Kenyan going to Rwanda. It's a Nigerian going to South Africa. So there's a lot of movement in the continent. But then there's this approximately 15% of the African population is migrating outside of the continent. And they're going to the Middle East. That's mm -hmm. their first destination. Why? Work, education, refuge. It's the same same thing. So what we have in the Middle East, um, a number of countries that have taken in um, African migrants, um, either for work or seeking refugee status. And Lebanon has a huge population of Ethiopian domestic workers, um, as does Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries. And these are... Did not know that. Did not. Right. I mean, these are maids, house cleaners, um, workers, maybe under the table. Yeah. And so it's it's it's... It's a very real thing that in search of a better life, you know, number of thousands of people from the Horn in particular, the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, um, they've they've had to make a very dangerous trek um, from Africa through Israel all the way. Yeah, because you look at the East. map, it's not an easy it's journey not easy. No. because even to go from like east of Africa, you have mm -hmm. to travel through Israel mm -hmm. um, and then making it through that conflict because, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, there's a conflict in Israel Palestine. <laughs> so you get through that conflict and then you have to work your way up through Syria, right? And right. then then pivot uh, and then right. go into Lebanon, right. right? And so, like, that is a heck of a journey. It's a dangerous do. journey and let me tell you, there are people, there are some really, really evil people out there kidnapping these migrants, putting them through torture, forcing these women to men and women and, and children and families to go through the unthinkable and so that's a whole nother segment but then you know their eye is on finding refuge anywhere wow. and and you know lebanon does have a huge population of domestic workers but i think you know at this point every country uh, has always received 
refugees. And yeah. even though the numbers and the migrant numbers continue to rise, mm-hmm. you know, this is really about how we just adjust to the 21st century. Yes. The reality that people are going to move. Borders are borders, but people are looking at the whole world. They are. You got the internet, you got social, you got all kinds of things at, at people's fingertips that makes them see what's possible or where they can find safety. Literally, I mean, and even from the private space. So mm-hmm. I have a lot of friends too as well who are interested in moving abroad. Uh, and is interested in living in other countries outside of the United States of America. Right. I know there's breaking news. Nobody would ever want to think that they want to leave the United States of America, but it's happening. Like there is this global interest that we have now. Um, somehow, as we begin to kind of conclude the conversation, I just, I, there are a couple of things I do just want to kind of just you know narrow in on, right? Mm-hmm. And as this migrant pattern begins to shift um, throughout these different countries, the thing that I'm watching, and I'm curious to see if you guys are watching this space too as well, is. Lebanon's ability to be able to absorb all of these migrants that are coming because essentially that's taking up resources in an already limited space of Lebanon. They're not one of the top GDPs in the world. Let's just be honest in what it is. And so there's water that's being, you know, um, taken away as resources as all these new migrants are coming. Uh, Food jobs and then just housing and space. So when that begins to compound and resources begin to get slim, then what happens, right? And one, I'm curious to see what your thoughts are about that. And then, is that why it's important that we have organizations like UNICEF? Is that why it's important that we have bodies like the United Nations uh, that come together collectively on an annual basis to address this, to have like this shared responsibility, if you will? Yeah, I think uh, you need to keep. We need to keep the pulse and our eye on those most in need. And you know, the United Nations member states, countries, you know, they've been committed since uh, 1948 to protection of human rights. But really, yes, it takes everyone to be at the table. Um, And I think what children are going through, what communities are going through in Lebanon, both Lebanese and migrant communities, um, it has been going on for decades. And yeah, Lebanon has um, absorbed numbers far more than I think most other countries have um, absorbed on the Syrian side. Um, But again, it's about how do we serve the populations that are from Lebanon and how do we observe the populations that are arriving? And that includes dealing with the root causes Mm -hmm. of the problem. So focusing on ending the uh, conflict in Syria, focusing on providing access. Um, It's tremendous, I think, the position that Lebanon is in, but it has continued to show an open door, uh, recognizing its responsibility, but also truthfully, yes, it has limits, as as do small states like that. So, I mean, look, there's so many things we can talk about. There's so many challenges out there in this world, uh, but I I definitely just want to since we begin to talk about uh, the content of Africa and diaspora, um, look, what gets attention, the way our news cycle works now is whatever is most trending, mm-hmm. right? And so we saw what was trending from the migrant caravan from Central America. We saw that was trending. And so um, thankfully we have this film now that can spotlight Lebanon. And so now we'll be talking about um, the Syrian and Lebanese refugees crisis, as we should. Uh, from a social perspective. Um, but what we won't be talking about, because there is just no spotlight on that, is the continent. And just hearing what you're saying, I had no idea. So I know I didn't give you a lot of time on this one. That means you just have to come back uh, oh, uh, for anytime. a part two with this is how should we be thinking about the continent of Africa uh, and how should we be thinking about the challenges that they're going through um, in order to help drive conversations forward? You know, about 10 years ago, we used to look at China and India as the next big thing because the populations were about to explode. And now we're seeing it with Africa. It's the next big thing. So Africa is the future. But it means that that population, we need to get ready for that. So young people, the average age in Africa is 17 years old. And that means a lot of young people are going to want opportunity. And I think those are the things we're going to start to hear. Storytelling. Social media is amazing. Between Twitter and Instagram, I find so many African voices, storytellers, creatives, um, leaders, using that platform to start to say they're, what they're going through or what they're thinking, how they're feeling. And it's tremendous. So I, I think we got to keep our eye on Africa because of the population and the growth we're about to experience. I also think we need to focus on the African diaspora, you know, not just the migrants who arrive, but also their children, descendants, people connected, because more and more people are feeling a kinship with the continent 
whether it's through their own personal journey or just the bond that they feel over social. So, yeah, I would I would definitely agree. we got to keep our eye on that. Tamara, you have been a fantastic guest. Uh, thank you so much for joining the Mike Muse Show. How can individuals reach you if they have questions um, for social media regarding that? Um, and also, too, how can individuals reach you at UNICEF? Is there a Twitter handle for UNICEF? Yeah, so first you can catch us at U- on Twitter at UNICEF USA, and you can also reach us at www.unicef.com. SFUSA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Semhar. Um, I love answering questions. I love reaching out. And just thank you, Mike, for the opportunity. No, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, thank you so much for tuning in to the Mike Muse Show. You can always reach me on Twitter at I am Mike Muse, M U S N S A E, also on Instagram. Can't wait to be back with you again next week for more fascinating conversation. Until then, we are out. Yeah.